the whole translation of the art of war from Sun Tzu, from ancient China. What do you, as a military strategist, and as the translator of this beautiful work, impress the most about any of those strategies? First, as a translator, the language. I love Wen Yin and uh, Sun Tzu's, everybody says Sun Tzu is very difficult, but when you get used to it, the Wen Yin is so clear and pure as a written language that I was really impressed. Two parts are very interesting. One is the last chapter, because it's very exciting, is about spies how different kind of spies you can use. But I think what impressed me more is the fact that he, very early, uh, he says that you, you do not have to pay attention only to military capabilities, but also to the economics, politics, alliances. So it's a very broad, wide vision of strategy on war. That's exactly what I want to ask you, Dr. Nike. What exactly is the art of war about? Is it about war or is it about peace? Well, it is about war. You cannot deny that it is about war. There are a lot of chapters in Sun Tzu about how to win wars in a very practical manner. And he describes all the different terrains of the war. But this is also about peace. And one of the most important things in Sun Tzu is that uh, you must win wars without making war, you know. And it has been very important for China in Chinese history how to try to convince a potential adversary that uh, his interest is in uh, accepting some conditions maybe, so it makes you win war without really making war. But uh, Sun Tzu is also written in very broad um, general terms, so you can also use what he says for your personal life, uh, he says that you have to make plans uh, to evaluate many uh, factors before making a decision. Among it, the strategies. One of the most well-known is know thyself, know thy enemy. You will always win no matter what. That's one of the most popular saying. How much does it say about planning strategy? It is one of the major conditions to win war, or not only war, but to, to, to be successful in any activities, is to know the conditions, conditions of the enemy and uh, conditions of the situation. So this is one of the major lessons from Sun Tzu, that you have to know yourself, of course, your limitation, it's very important, and to know uh, the enemy, and that enemy is to be taken in a very broad sense. I mean, mm. it's not only the enemy uh, in today's terms, it's just in relations with others, whatever the other is. Mm. And you've been doing research about East Asia security for a long time. If I ask you, which part of the strategy should decision makers in East Asia look at? when it comes to Sun Tzu, the art of war. For today's world, today's region, what would you say? Uh, I think the most important uh, lesson from Sun Tzu is to remember that for Sun Tzu, as for everybody else, war is extremely costly. It costs, it, I mean, it has a cost, a huge human cost, economic cost. And so one has to be extremely prudent and careful uh, before engaging in policies that could lead uh, to a possible war. Sun Tzu, wrote that book in order to help the sovereign, as he said, to win war. Uh, but uh, his main lesson, once again, was that uh, war was extremely costly and was, was to be avoided as much as possible. One of the things people are extremely interested in these days is what would happen when there is power shift in the world? And we know mm -hmm. there is. The speed and the prospect is not known. So in that regard, Dr. Nike, what would you say among the art of war? Which part of the wisdom can we draw from in order to shine some lights on the prospects? Well, power shift is a reality. It doesn't have to, uh, the result mustn't uh, be a war between powers. And I think the most important thing is to be able to manage relations between emerging power or more or less declining power. Once again, avoid mis misperception about a declining power that maybe is not so declining. So one has to be very careful 
and well informed. And one of the most important lessons maybe from Sun Tzu is to know that he put a lot of stress on the autonomy of the military. Mm -hmm. He thought that military people used to knew the reality very well, what they can do, what they cannot do, and that the prince must not put pressure on the military to act against the interest of the nation. But that's not the case anymore. It seems that the military has become part of the government and the military will make its decision based on the decision coming yes. from the central government, no matter which country we're talking yes, about. Yes, this is why the governments must be extremely careful in making their decision between deciding for actions that could lead to conflicts or war, because once again for Sun Tzu, and I think this is the most important lesson, is war is extremely, whatever the result, war is extremely costly. And these days, it is mainly a debate between the civilian and the military side of the government about whether to proceed with the war or a small-scale conflict. Usually, the latter, which is the military, would debate for pro, uh, while the, civil, the civilian side would uh, rather be more careful. So when you look at the ancient wisdoms coming from Sun Tzu, more than, you know, take a look at it, more than 2,500 years ago, uh, does it really help? I think if you take it once again in general terms, it helps. It always helps to make plans, to think well before acting, mm -hmm. uh, to respect some division. Uh, you said that the military is part of the civilian power and the civilian do, uh, but uh, the military are very well informed uh, about the real situation sometimes. And sometimes the civilian people do not really know what is the real situation. So this is why it, they, they need to debate and be extremely careful in evaluating what can be done and what cannot be done. Mm. What do you make of the United States status and position in today's world as a military strategist? A lot of countries are eager to have the United States on their side. So we don't know what the United States might or might not do, but I think it will be a big, uh, a huge miscal miscalculation to extrapolate from what is going on in Europe by considering that the um, United States will not be ready to act in East Asia. And we, I mean, these miscalculations happened before. And uh, a war with the United States uh, in East Asia would be, for everybody, extremely, once again, costly, uh, many fields. And I think this is something that has to be avoided at all costs. In Sun Tzu, The Art of War, there has been a specific quote, pretend inferiority and encourage his arrogance. That, of course, is a military strategy during warfares, meaning that just pretend to be low profile, inferior, so that the other side would feel much superior and even become arrogant. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting debate that we also have in China about its foreign policy. Should China remain low profile? Well, I would say that uh when China was choosing to keep low profile, it has been extremely successful, and including extremely successful in gaining support from all countries in the region. Uh, I remember the time when, when all countries in Southeast Asia were very eager to develop relations with China, perceived always as an opportunity and were not very eager to have the United States playing a role in East Asia. I don't want to interpret too much, but I must recognize that since a few years ago, uh, the mood has changed. Uh, countries in Southeast Asia, inclu including countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, were very close to China, are much more prudent. And still want to have good relations with China, but are more eager than before to build relations with the United States. So I would say, this is my personal point of view, that uh, the strategy of keeping a low profile might be mm -hmm. more successful. And uh, this is what Deng Xiaoping said. I mean, you bide your time, not only for biding your time, but just to have the time to build your own power. And so I think this is a very important lesson to remember. But then on the other hand, what to make 
of the future. When we have a changing future, we need to lay out the plans and the thoughts to the others. How much is it about the level of strategic thinking communication? How much is it about the level of real actions? That is also an interesting debate as we are facing a changing world. Yes, I think uh, but to go back to Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu said that you I'm have glad to... we're going back to yes, Sun Tzu. Yes, yes, we are back to Sun Tzu. And uh, I think he said that you have to make plan by looking carefully at all the factors and evaluating all the factors. Um, I think this is what politicians, uh, and not only military strategists, mm -hmm. and economists too, have to do. I mean, just look at all the different factors, not rush to make decisions, be extremely prudent and careful, and I think this is the best way to plan for the future. Uh, things we're talking about Europe. Which part of the art of war do you think, and the philosophy related to it, can really help Europe today? I mean, you have a lot of crisis going on. It's very difficult for me to find a solution in Sun Tzu for <laughs> Europe because we are in such a mess yes. these days. And also, you are in the mountain. It's hard to look at the mountain when you are in the mountain. <laughs> uh. Yes, exactly. So I'm. I'm I don't know if I can find in Suze, in Suze, uh, any lessons for Europe. What I know is that things have to change and to evolve because the situation in Europe is not very good these days on many fields, uh, be it uh, economics or uh, relations inside the European Union, yes. For Sun Tzu, there's a specific quote, never to have military alliance or at least very careful about it. That, of course, lead, lead us to NATO. What would you make of its future? The Cold War has already ended. The so Cold War has ended by countries um, belonging to NATO. Do not, see, do not see it as an obsolete organization. And uh, as you know, France uh, is back into <laughs> NATO. Yes. Even, even France is back into NATO, and the former Eastern European countries are very eager to, to maintain NATO. And as long as uh, Europe will not have uh, its own defense capabilities, uh, as the European Union, I think that uh, NATO will be believed or felt to be very necessary to, European, to a lot of European countries. Is it going to be one weapon against Russia? I don't think that uh, to ostracize Russia is a good solution. Dr. Nige, it's such a pleasure to have you. All the best. I'm looking forward to reading more Sun Tzu, The Art of War. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Maxi Google, thank you. Google. Thank you.